Excellencies, Madam Executive Secretary, distinguished delegates, the meeting is called to order. Good morning and welcome to the third session of the Committee on Macroeconomic Policy, Poverty Reduction and Financing for Development. As this is the first time this committee session is conducted in a fully virtual mode, I want to assure all delegates that the Secretariat has made every effort to allow the session to be conducted smoothly and with minimal disruptions. This session is held via an e-conference platform, KUDO. You will be able to turn on your microphone and camera only when your request to speak has been submitted and accepted through the platform. We also welcome participants joining us via YouTube. Kindly note that remote simultaneous interpretation of the proceedings is provided by the United Nations for the purpose of facilitating communication in the light of the fact that there are six official languages of the UN and four of which are used at ESCAP. Participants are requested to be mindful of the additional difficulties experienced by interpreters when working in remote mode and of the increased likelihood of the disruptions to the audio feed to the interpreters. Only the speech or intervention in the original language is authentic and constitutes an authentic record of the proceedings. In case of any inconsistency between the interpretation and the speech or intervention in the original language, the latter shall prevail. In addition, interpreters servicing remote meetings cannot be held liable for interruption of service, pixelation, freezing or loss of visual input, partial or complete loss of audio, audible artifacts, and authorized access to personal or confidential data, leaking of information due to inadequate soundproofing and or data loss. Thank you for your attention to these matters. Thank you, Nixie. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, good morning and a warm welcome to the opening of the third session of the Committee on Macroeconomic Policy, Poverty Reduction and Financing for Development. My name is Hamza Ali Malik and I'm the Director of Macroeconomic Policy and Financing for Development Division at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. I have the pleasure to invite Ms. Amida Salsia Alice Jabana, United Nations Under Secretary General and Executive Secretary of the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific to deliver her welcoming address. Madam Executive Secretary, please. Her Excellency Ibu Sri Mulyani Indrawati, Minister of Finance Indonesia, His Excellency Mr. Omar Ayub Khan, Federal Minister for Economic Affairs Pakistan, His Excellency Mr. Arkom Tarmpit Taya Baisit, Minister of Finance Thailand, His Excellency Mr. Leon Ponagai Shering, Minister of Finance Bhutan, His Excellency Mr. Mustafa Kamal, Minister of Finance Bangladesh, Pak Bambang Susantono, Vice President of ADB, Mr. Elliot Harris from UN DESA. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Warm welcome to the third session of the Committee on Macroeconomic Policy, Poverty Reduction and Financing for Development. Since this committee last met in 2019, our world has experienced an unprecedented global health emergency crisis and a subsequent devastating economic crisis. The COVID-19 pandemic has transformed the way we live, do business, and learn. In addition to the pandemic, the Asia-Pacific region continues to experience unprecedented natural disaster due to climate change. 
In short, we have seen the last two years just how vulnerable the Asia-Pacific region is to both the economic and non-economic shocks. In 2020, the Asia-Pacific region recorded its worst economic performance in decades. Worryingly, about 89 million people in the region may have been pushed back into extreme poverty, according to ESCAP estimates. The disproportionate impact on the poor and vulnerable groups and the uneven access to COVID-19 vaccines have exacerbated already high and rising economic inequalities both within and across countries. Even before the pandemic, the region was not on track to achieving the SDGs. Since the pandemic, countries' ability to achieve the SDGs by 2030 and the Paris Agreement for Climate Action is at an even greater risk. In this context, to build back better, our Economic and Social Survey of Asia and the Pacific 2021 proposes illustrative policy packages that aim to provide universal access to social services, close the di digital divide, and strengthen climate and clean energy actions. Our estimates show that such a package could help reduce the number of poor people in the region by almost 180 million, cut carbon emissions by about 30%, and boost the potential output level by over 10% in the long run. However, given its high financing costs and shrinking government revenues, delivering such policy packages could undermine public debt sustainability in some of the region's developing countries. Furthermore, due to ongoing recovery efforts, many countries are experiencing constrained fiscal space. There is a risk that financing flows are diverted away from development financing, which is needed to achieve SDGs and meet a nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement. This is why economic recovery efforts and policies must align with policies and strategies to pursue SDGs and climate action to ensure that moving forward, we are able to truly build back better. To achieve this, we need innovative financing mechanism and national and regional commitments toward net zero to support member states in identifying and promoting concrete financing solutions. The Secretary General has launched the initiative on financing for development in the era of COVID-19 and beyond. Six thematic clusters have been established to work on sustainability and climate action, socio-economic response, finance and technology, liquidity and debt vulnerability, illicit financial flow, and addressing special country needs. These issues, combined with country efforts in responding to the pandemic, are at the heart of the con conversation that the Secretariat wishes member states to share and reflect on in the next three days. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in this vein, I would like to highlight policy proposals for your consideration and further guidance. How can the Asia-Pacific region recover better together? In other words, how can post-pandemic development be more inclusive, resilient, and sustainable? A broad mix of public policies are available, such as government support for labor market recovery, economic redistribution policies, a whole of government approach to manage shocks, carbon pricing, and fiscal incentives for attracting green private investments. In addition to sharing its perspectives, the committee may also provide guidance on how the Secretariat can provide targeted technical assistance on some of these issues. How can the Asia-Pacific region mobilize the needed fiscal and financial resources to secure more inclusive, resilient, and sustainable development? Specifically, how can countries leverage the potential of innovative and digital financing strategies, such as thematic bonds, climate risk disclosure and reporting, debt for climate swaps, and digital payment solutions. The committee may identify desirable domestic and multilateral policy and regulatory actions and provide guidance to the Secretariat on how to support member states in developing and executing such actions. In this context, the committee will be considering a proposal to establish a consultative group on financing strategies for the Sustainable Development Goals. 
Given the importance of fiscal resources and financing strategies to recover better together from the pandemic, this proposed consultative group would facilitate a more regular and substantive communication between the committee and the secretariat and relevant government ministries. I look forward to member states' support for this proposal. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, despite the new challenges our region has faced since we last met, we have remained resilient. The pandemic has provided an opportunity for us to reconsider our policies and strategies and align fiscal and financial resources with development efforts that will pay significant dividends in the future. We have also learned that we are more connected now than ever before in our history. The importance of resilient supply chain and digital technology to enable business continuity has been paramount. This is a time for us to come together, debate, and converge on the key issues that matter, which is getting back on track to achieve SDGs and working towards a net zero future. I'm optimistic that the future is bright for this region, and it is up to us to deliver. To deliver. I look forward to engaging deliberation over the coming days. I hope that it sets us on a path forward to deliver together. Thank you very much for your attention. I wish you very successful committee session. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ibu Amida. We are honored to have Her Excellency Ms. Shiri Mulyani Indravati, Minister of Finance, Indonesia, with us as a keynote speaker. Ms. Indravati, you have the floor, madam. Thank you so much. It's really my pleasure uh, to participate in this uh, very important session. And very good morning to all of you, whether in Bangkok or any other places. Uh, my dear fellow ministers, distinguished colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are witnessing the global economic recovery, which is not even. The speed as well as the ability to recover for each economy depend on a uh, number of factors. This is including the access of vaccination and the speed of vaccination. Also, the capacity of the fiscal and monetary support and coordination between the two very important authority to recover the economy. And currently, the world also facing a new challenge that is unsynchronized policy due to the speed of the recovery, which is not even. We also witnessing supply disruption and increasing energy price that will complicate the challenge of recovery of many emerging and developing countries. So the, the question for all of us now is how we are going to be able to recover together in an inclusive, resilient and sustainable way. Inclusive recovery will uh, depend on how we are going to design the policy so that no one leave behind. The priority of the recovery should focus on first saving the people from the health threat because we are currently facing the pandemic, which is a health uh, issue. So vaccination, testing, tracing, and treatment is gonna be very critical. Unfortunately, each country have different health system. This pandemic provide us with very important and valuable lesson. Building a reliable, effective health system is gonna be critical, not only for one country, but for global uh, community. And this is what need to be coordinated given the challenge of pandemic is actually coming from first one country, then spreading to the whole world. How we are going to be able to help each country to build a health system, which is effective, efficient, and can detect the current as well as future pandemic. This is going to be one of the most important on the third uh, issue that I'm going to uh, discuss about the role of multilateral institution. Second one, to be able to have a sustainable, inclusive and resilient recovery is to support people, especially the poor. 
So during this very critical time, expanding and increasing social safety net is gonna be very important. This is not only in the form of cash transfer, but sometimes we also have to do an extraordinary thing. For Indonesia, we provide even electricity support or freeing the poor family from electricity bill or providing significant discount and also providing internet uh, subsidy for all students as well as teacher. This is because during pandemic, we have to do learning and schooling from home. The third, to be able to be inclusive, we have to support especially small medium enterprises. This is especially for them to be able to access new capital even during this hardship. And that will require a close collaboration with financial institution. Technology, especially digital technology, will provide a lot of support during this very critical time, whether this is for education, health, as well as supporting small and medium enterprises. Sustainable recovery uh, means that we have to be able to design green recovery during this very difficult time. Of course, this requires a lot of resources. For Indonesia, forestry is very, very critical in reducing the CO2, not only good for Indonesia, but also for the world. And that's why combining recovery with commitment to uh, build a green growth, we also provide a labor intensive and uh, for mangrove replanting, which actually serving two things both in terms of commitment of CO2 reduction, but also at the same time provide a cash transfer or support for people. We also designing the transition toward green growth, especially on energy sector, which require a lot of support from the financing side, both in retiring a more fossil fuel base, but second one, how we are going to invest on a new renewable energy. But this needs to be done in affordable and just way because we don't want to create another disruption on the energy that then can jeopardize the recovery itself. The third one is introducing carbon market, including carbon taxation as an instrument to be able to then work based on a market mechanism. Financial sources is going to be critical on the recovery. Use this crisis to deepen our reform is very critical. For Indonesia, we have two very important reform. First, improving investment climate to passing the legislation on job creation legislation or law, which improve significantly and simplify, debureaucratize the investment climate in Indonesia. The second one is reform on taxation which will hopefully introduce uh, and improve and strengthen domestic resource mobilization. This is critical, even though that we are now doing an extraordinary policy on a fiscal expansion, we have to be able to consolidate and restore the health of our fiscal, fiscal tool. Cooperation closely with monetary policy or authority is going to be very critical. How we are going to be able to coordinate without sacrificing the integrity of macroeconomic framework and especially independency of central bank. Now, let me touch the last important issue that is the role of multilateral institution, including UN, WHO, as well as World Bank and IMF. We are now facing more and more a borderless issue or challenges. Pandemic is a perfect example. Climate change is another perfect uh, uh, challenge. And this kind of issue cannot be addressed by one country alone. The cooperation and coordination, not only in terms of policy is gonna be very critical. The role of multilateral institution in coordinating and facilitating of this collaboration is going to be critical. Re financial resources for providing global public goods is going to be critical. 
pandemic preparedness definitely require a cooperation at the global level, but also improving the health system of each country. This requires resources, but also governance that reflect the need for global community to respond to this kind of challenge. Climate change is also critical, but that can be addressed if each country have the ability to tap financial resources as well as technology. These two very important and critical sources for each country to be able to deliver commitment on a climate change is going to be very critical. Again, this will also require multilateral cooperation. How we are going to establish resources, not only from public, but also private, and how we are going to be able to create a co cooperation so that the access of financing and resources will create affordability and just transition for each country. I wish you all to have a very good and productive session. And this is going to be the challenge for all of us. Our homework for each country to deepen reform, to restore rec and recover the economy, and at the same time, restoring the health, not only the people, but also our fiscal and economy while at the same time, we have to collaborate and coordinate across region and globally. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Indrawati, for your remarks and support for multilateral work, including for the UN and including the work of this committee. Now it is my pleasure to invite His Excellency, Mr. Umar Ayub Khan, Federal Minister for Economic Affairs, Pakistan to deliver a keynote address. Mr. Khan, you have the floor. Uh, Mr. Khan, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now, sir? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Okay. Honorable dignitaries, Ms. Armida Salsea Alasjas Bana, Under Secretary General of United Nations and Executive Secretary of UNSCAP, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for inviting me to the third session of the Committee on Macroeconomic Policy, Poverty Reduction, and Financing for Development. I must congratulate UNSCAP for successfully completing two sessions of this meeting and organizing a third session. I would like to express that eradicating poverty in all its forms remains one of the greatest challenges facing humanity. Poverty eradication must be mainstreamed into the national policies and actions in accordance with the international, internationally agreed development goals forming part of the broad United Nations development agenda. The SDGs are a commitment to end poverty in all forms and dimensions by 2030. This involves targeting the most vulnerable, increasing basic resources and services, and supporting communities affected by conflict and climate-related disasters. The SDGs are a universal call to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity. Pakistan has displayed commendable commitment to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development as it was one of the first countries to endorse it globally in 2015. In the recent years, Pakistan has witnessed significant macroeconomic imbalances due to a combination of multiple factors like rising international commodity prices, global financial crisis, and domestic supply constraints. The immediate aim, therefore, is to consolidate the emerging macroeconomic stability through appropriate monetary and fiscal measures aimed at crowding in the private investment, mobilizing domestic savings, and reviving the economic growth process. The services sector contributes more than 58% to the GDP of Pakistan and has emerged as a major driver of the economic growth in the recent past. There is still unexplored potential in key services 
such as domestic commerce, transport, finance and insurance, communication, housing, tourism, social and community services. Appropriate measures will be designed to effectively harness the potential of this sector. With the pandemic, the government has been focused on managing the repeated COVID-19 infection waves, implementing a mass vaccination campaign, expanding its cash transfer program, and providing accommodative monetary conditions to sustain economic growth. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to brief the participants about the initiatives taken by the government of Pakistan for poverty reduction. One of the main initiatives is the SAS program, which is a social safety and poverty alleviation program launched by the government of Pakistan in March 2019. The SAS program specifically focuses on investment in the social sector and human development. The purpose of this program is to promote financial inclusion and access to digital services. One of the main objectives of this program is women empowerment. SAS aims to empower 10 million poorest women in Pakistan and help them to achieve their potential. Women empowerment is absolutely critical to ending poverty and is a key principle of the SAS program. The program constantly follows the 50% rule for women inclusion in all its initiatives, including interest-free loans, scholarships, and asset transfers. The follow-up program has been recently launched by the Prime Minister and will ensure financial and digital inclusion of 7 million disadvantaged women across Pakistan. I would like to talk about the National Poverty Graduation Program, NPGP, which is supported by the Government of Pakistan and the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD. The program aims at assisting the poor in coming out of poverty, simultaneously improving their overall food security, nutritional status, and resilience to climate change. The program activities are planned to be implemented in 388 union councils of 23 districts across Pakistan. Another initiative taken by the government of Pakistan is Kamyab Jawan program. It is the first of its kind in Pakistan. This program provides assistance and resources to youth on a national level. Through this platform, the country's youth aged 15 to 29 years will benefit from youth empowerment programs, loans for young entrepreneurs and startups, in enabling legislations and representative councils. Through this program, Pakistani youth is finally being integrated into civil institutions and given responsibility to lift themselves out of poverty. The loans will be dispersed to small and medium-sized enterprises, beneficiaries across Pakistan, covering Punjab, Sindh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, Balochistan, Gilgit, Baltistan, and Azad, Jammu, and Kashmir. The program aims to provide 25% of the loans to women entrepreneurs. Ladies and gentlemen, BISP is a federal scheme that was launched back in 2008. Its purpose was to provide unconditional cash support to help struggling families living in poverty in Pakistan. It remains the largest support program in the country. BISP distributed approximately 90 billion rupees, approximately equivalent to $542 million to 5 million low-income Pakistanis. Additionally, the program uses tools such as its BISP debit cards to make cash transfers convenient. The program especially helps women and low-income Pakistanis from minority groups to gain access to financial assistance. The financing for development process mainly include the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. Boosting financing for development is fundamental for the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for sustainable development. The UN strategy for financing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development plays a significant role in supporting the efforts of Pakistan in pursuit of the SDGs. Pakistan was the first country to adopt the SDGs 2030 Agenda through a unanimous resolution of the country's parliament. The government of Pakistan conducted discussions on the post-millennium development goals with all stakeholders for coordinating and strengthening efforts at the federal and provincial levels to achieve its sustainable development and poverty reduction targets. 
the consultation process emphasized the need for national categorization of SDGs, improved data collection and enforcement of monitoring mechanisms. Ladies and gentlemen, I firmly believe that the involvement of the private sector is paramount in, sustain, in achieving sustainable development goals. In order to attract the private sector investment, Pakistan, taking the lead, is developing the first SDGs investor map to empower global investors with insights, tools, networks, and facilitation for transactions. Pakistan, as an emerging economy, has private investment opportunity of 96.2 billion US dollars in infrastructure related SDGs in aligned sectors of power, digital access, transport, clean water, and sanitation. Pakistan could greatly benefit from the knowledge and the resource base available with UNSCAP for the economic and social development of Pakistan. In the end, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all a very productive session and assure you of our continued commitment of working with UNSCAP to making a lasting contribution to national development priorities, to improve the living conditions of all the people in the country. The government of Pakistan reaffirms this partnership, outlining our collective aspirations for a new reality for Pakistan, a reality free from poverty, vulnerability, and deprivation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Khan, for your statement and sharing policy initiatives that your government have taken to address the issue of poverty in particular. Now it is my pleasure to invite His Excellency, Mr. Arkham Thurmpitaya Paisit, Minister of Finance, Royal Thai Government, to deliver his keynote speech. Mr. Thurmpitaya Paisit, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellency Ms. Amida Saucia Ali Jabana, Under Secretary General of the United Nations <clears throat> and Executive Secretary of the Economic and Social Commission for the Asia Pacific or in UNSCAP. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is, it is my great pleasure to deliver this keynote address to the Committee on Macroeconomic Policies poverty reduction and financing for development organized by the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific today. I would like to take this opportunity to share my perspective on the role of the Minister of Finance during COVID-19 crisis and five key approaches to support the revitalize the Thai economy after the pandemic in order to achieve a sustainable growth. The Ministry of Finance has been working to develop a sustainable and resilient economy through a variety of short and long and long term physical policies. Particularly during the time of economic crisis caused by the pandemic. As you are aware, the Thai economy has been severely impacted by a series of the COVID-19 outbreaks since last year. The government has acted promptly to contain the spread of virus and to allocate all necessary fiscal and financial resources to assist healthcare system and to provide relief to affected people, workers, and businesses. Many government support programs have been implemented to help relieve impact to the people who suddenly were unemployed or reduced wage payment during the lockdown period to be able to live by government cash transfer. At the same time, other programs, including the co-payment and tax deductible expenses, have also been implemented to maintain the level of domestic consumption. Job retention program has also been implemented through cash directly transfer to SMEs. These supports will continue to the future growth prospect for Thai economy. Ladies and gentlemen, as the government continues to handle the COVID-19 situation, the government is also laying foundation for Thailand's sustainable growth. Going forward, COVID-19 will become endemic and the people will have to, leave, to learn to live with the new normal. The virus may not be eliminated, but it will be eventually be contained. Taking into account 
the government will focus on five key approaches to support the Thai economic recovery as follows. First, financial and monetary measures to remedy and support COVID-19 affected entrepreneurs to recover firmly, such as the debt restructuring program and soft loan schemes. Second, macroeconomic management by maintaining economic and fiscal stability, public debt management, as well as improving the tax collection system and maintaining an appropriate level of uh, inflation. Third, reducing poverty and inequality by implementing an economic policies that improve the welfare system, quality of life of the people, and distribute the prosperity to the region, uh, regional area of Thailand. Fourth, creating a well-established social safety net. All citizens will be able to receive proper social protections from the government through voluntary and participatory channels such as social security, social security fund, provident funds, government pension funds, and national saving fund. Fifth, the government is planning to reopen our country to international travelers and tourists. The prime minister statement is clear that from the 1st of November, Thailand will allow foreign visitors to enter mm -hmm. Thailand without any requirement for quarantine. If they are fully vaccinated and arrive by air from low risk countries, tourists are required to present a negative COVID test and being test once again upon arrival. Given the current trend, we expected that the, by the end of this year, we would be able to witness the positive growth of the Thai economy. Strong Thai merchandise export will be the key driver of the economy. For 2022 next year, Thai economy is projected to recover with stronger momentum in the range of the 4 to 5 percent, with tourism rebound, rebound and improving COVID-19 situation. For post-COVID-19 policies, the Thai government will focus on the following four strategies. The first is the promotion of bio-circular green economy. Bio-circular green economy model, or BCT model. This economic model will emphasize the creation of high value products from biological resources, considering reusing various materials as much as possible and environmentally and friendly economic development. The government has taken some measures to promote BCG economy model, such as the issuance of green, social and sustainability bond, and the promotion of investment in electric vehicles within 2030. Early this year, we were successfully able to issue the first batch of the sustainability bond and were invited to list in the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. Second, economic restructuring towards new industry by accelerating investment in large-scale infrastructure projects, as well as focusing on the investment in 12 targeted industry. To name is, is a S curve, the new S curve. To name a few, the next generation automotive intelligence electronics and high value and medical tourism, as well as medical treatment and wellness. The investment in the Eastern Economic Corridor, which will be our new growth engine, will enhance Thailand competitiveness and improve the productivity of the economy. Third, digitalization is another key area to increase Thailand's competitiveness I think digital transform, uh, digitalization is, all, is the issue for all the country in the Asia Pacific as well. Digital transformation must be prioritized by both the private and public sectors. The government is facilitating the public by introducing e-tax filing 
state-owned enterprise transactions in order to reduce costs associated with cash transaction. Fourth, the government continues to invest in a more advanced infrastructure so as to help improve our competitiveness. The investment will be focusing on greener infrastructure, especially on the mass transit system, cleaner energy in the area of the renewable energy. More solar energy and small power producers are the target. On top of these four strategies, the innovative financing is essential. Perhaps green financing could be a starting point. Also, a consultative group in financing could also be an effective mechanism. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that the third session of the Committee on Macroeconomic Policy, Poverty Reduction and Financing for Development will be a place where everyone can exchange our experiences, constructive views and guidance on how we can move towards the SDG to transform our world. Lastly, UNSCAP can contribute to sustainable development of Asia Pacific region with its valuable partnership with member countries in providing result oriented projects, technical assistance and capacity building. I wish and I hope to continue our close policy co cooperation between the Ministry of Finance and the UN ISCAP and wish a successful meeting today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Tumpitaya Paisit, for your statement, valuable insights, and support to the work of ASCAP in this committee. Now it is my pleasure to request the conference room officer to play the video recording of His Excellency Mr. Leompo Namge Shering, Minister of Finance, Royal Government of Bhutan's keynote address. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to convey the warm greetings and wishes of His Majesty the King, Her Majesty the Queen, the Royal Government, and the people of Bhutan. As I address this August gathering, let, me t let us take a moment to remember and pray for all the precious life that are lost and affected by the wrathful forces of the pandemic. While the COVID-19 pandemic has brought unimaginable suffering, triggered economic crises, and caused social unrest, I hope that this period of turmoil will go down in history as an epoch of an unprecedented human spirit where the world stood together with resilience in the face of adversity. Bhutan is grateful to all our bilateral and multilateral partners for your support that we have received thus far. The pandemic has served as a timely intervention for global leaders and the governments alike to reset and realign our policies and priorities. It is therefore necessary to ensure that our policy measures and plans are in consonance with the ambitions of 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, a feat that is much easier said than done. In Bhutan, our development pathway is guided by the philosophy of gross national happiness, pioneered by His Majesty the Fourth King in 1972. The gross national happiness emphasizes on the holistic and sustainable development as opposed to the conventional notion of equating growth with GDP. As the development principles of GNH strongly resonates with the sustainable development goals, Bhutan was able to plan and implement the SDGs by mainstreaming them into our already existing national plans and programs. In September 2015, Bhutan adopted the 2030 Agenda and SDGs during the 70th session for the United Nations General Assembly. Since then, Bhutan volunteered to present its first voluntary national review report to the United Nations High Level Political Forum in July 2018. The report discussed the efforts and processes in implementing the SDGs, and it was reported that all the 17 SDGs were broadly on track. In keeping with its commitment to 2030 agenda, Bhutan volunteered for a Vienna presentation which was held on 15th of July 2021. The Vienna report 
was structured around the theme of transformational process that built on the past achievements and draw lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic as Bhutan works to build back better while working ahead towards the LTG graduation. It was also reported that the SDG awareness, the indicators adoption and data availability have improved since the first VNR back in 2018. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to provide a brief overview of the macroeconomic situation in Bhutan. As it is evident from the negative impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on the economic, social and health sector at the global scale, disease do not respect boundaries. Bhutan is no exception to the impacts of COVID-19. The country's economy experienced the largest contraction in 2020 and the growth is expected to dip further to an all-time low of negative 10% as a result of COVID-19 impact on the key economic sector such as tourism, construction and manufacturing. However, amidst the, the crisis triggered by the pandemic, Bhutan was able to realize the true essence of a selfless and prescient leader. His Majesty led the country with the wisdom and empirical knowledge on one hand and care and benevolence on the other. As an imminent respite and relief, His Majesty launched Drugalpo's relief Kidu to protect the livelihood of those affected by the pandemic due to an unpredictability of the situation and His Majesty's relief measure had been extended till June 2022. Under the leadership of His Majesty, the government embraced a comprehensive national response measure ranging from the public health safety to the economic revival and ensured that the response measure strikes the balance between saving lives and protecting livelihoods. To mitigate the social economic impact of the pandemic on the sectors like tourism, construction and agriculture, the economic contingency plan was initiated back in March 2020. Further to ensure the continuity of the businesses, the royal government have initiated various fiscal and monetary measures, including provisioning of a government-guaranteed credit scheme as a counter-cyclical policy measure. The government also pursued an expansion of fiscal sense with the implementation of a high-level capital budget for the financial year 2021 and 22. The budget has been formulated with a theme to ensure sustained economic sustainability stability for a re resilient recovery with the overall objective to maintain public confidence, sustain economic activities, transform health and education system, leverage on ICT and innovation, enable whole of the government reform initiatives. Despite the challenges posed by the limited resources and capacity, the country was able to emerge victorious with the marginal devastation from the pandemic through the concerted and coordinated effort of our beloved king government and the people. I would like to take this opportunity to provide a brief update on the COVID-19 situation in Bhutan. Till date, we have seen just three COVID-related deaths and about 2,600 plus cases, and most of which were imported. While a majority of the eligible adult population has already been vaccinated, the second dose for the ages 12 to 17 years are currently being administered and the first dose for children aged 5 to 11 years will be administered in the third and fourth week of October, taking the total vaccination coverage to around 90%. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, let me now speak about Bhutan's imp impending graduation from the least developed countries category. It's a matter of great pride and a joy in Bhutan's development journey that we will be graduating from an LDC status in 2023. As you may be aware, Bhutan was found eligible for graduation in both the triennial reviews of 2015 and 2019 respectively. Thus, Bhutan pronounced in 2019 to graduate in 2023 coinciding with the formal completion of the current 12-5 year plan. While we have economic challenges posed by the pandemic, our commitment to graduation in 2023 remains unaltered. Our prominent challenge to Bhutan's graduation and post-graduation that may derail our heart and development gains 
is the impending risk of a climate change. We remain highly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. The agriculture sector provides a livelihood to more than 60% of the Bhutanese population and the hydropower, the bedrock of the country's economy, are highly climate sensitive. To address the disproportionate brunt of climate impacts, Bhutan, in tandem with the climate finance institutions, strives to pursue the climate actions, although the financial burden is disproportionately significant. It is evidential true that the call for global and regional partnership is crucial for Bhutan to continue and sustain its carbon neutrality and a low carbon and climate resilient development pathways. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, let me also take this opportunity to share some of our development priority areas as we move forward in the context of a pandemic and LDC graduation. We will give our utmost importance to our economic recovery and ensure that rest to restore normalcy at the earliest possible. In addition to continued socio-economic development and drawing experience from the pandemic, we remain committed to reinforce and strengthen our developmental plans in the areas of renewable energy, health and education, food self-sufficiency, employment generation, and of course, riding on artificial intelligence. Subsequently, as we graduate, it is obvious that some of the development partners may phase out and the grant assistance to Bhutan could reduce, while on the other hand, the country's need and aspiration will keep growing. Moving forward, to fill up this gap and to sustain our development plans and for, the, and for realizing the SDG targets, we will explore different modes of financing such as climate finance, highly constitutional loans from the MDBs, public-private partnerships, and issuance of green bonds. In conclusion, I would like to reiterate Bhutan's commitment towards fulfilling the SDGs, which have high level of synergy with our development plans and the programs. I wish everyone a very successful conference. Thank you and Tashtile. Now it is my pleasure to request the conference room officer to play the video recording of His Excellency Mr. A. H. M. Mustafa Kamal, Minister of Finance of Bangladesh, keynote address. Bismillah ar Our Excellency Dr. Armidir Salsiya Ali Sahabana, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, greetings to you all from beautiful Bangladesh. I begin with a humble tribute to our father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, whose enormous sacrifice and leadership presented us the independent Bangladesh, our beloved motherland. I express my gratitude to the United Nations staff for providing me this opportunity to share with you all the remarkable stories of Bangladesh development journey focusing on the key role of our regional cooperation. My dear friends, the year 2021 is a very distinct and auspicious for our nation. This year, we are celebrating the golden jubilee of our independence. This celebration coincides with the Mujib year, the birth centenary of our father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Concurrently, receiving the United Nations final recommendation for our graduation from the eldest to a developing economy has added another historic milestone and made this year more momentous for us. My dear friends, we set our mid-term target to see a hunger and poverty free Bangladesh by 2031. Our long-term vision is to transform Bangladesh into a knowledge-based developed country by 2041 and a prosperous and resilient Delta by, 20, by 2100, as was the dream of the father of the nation, Pongabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic posed a great concern worldwide, and Bangladesh is no exception to it. 
the last decade prior to the COVID-19 outbreak, Bangladesh has shown an unprecedented growth momentum with a growth rate of 8.15% in their fiscal year 2019. COVID-19 brought enormous challenges to our development pathway. But due to the extraordinary leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister, Her Excellency Shakasina, we have been able to successfully manage the challenges. A far-sighted balance between lives and livelihood is bringing back the normalcy in our economy. Excellencies, we rolled out 28 stimulus packages worth US dollar 23 billion, which is 6.23% of our GDP to keep our economy afloat. Through the implementation of these timely stimulus packages, the government has been able to play a highly effective role in employment creation and recovery, stimulating domestic demand and keeping economic activities moving forward. Due to well-timed intervention, while the global economy is estimated to see a contraction of 3%, Bangladesh is among the few economies with positive growth, and that is 3.5% 3, 3 in 2020 and 5.5% in 2021. And it is now projected that in the 2020-23, our, we are expecting our growth should be around 7%. Distinguished participants, reiterating our, reiterating our Honorable Prime Minister's call to the world community in the last, in the just concluded United Nations General Assembly. We must ensure universal and affordable access to vaccines for people across the globe. In the United Nations General Assembly, our Prime Minister also urged to treat COVID-19 vaccines as a global public good. After that, the same message was echoed by many other leaders, but unfortunately, yet these calls remain large. My dear friends, our decadal performance has been acknowledged in the latest Sustainable Development Report 2021 published by United Nations sponsored Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which is known as SDSN. Our beloved leader, Honorable Prime Minister, Her Excellency Sheikh Hasina, has been honored with the SDG Progress Award by the SDSN during the 76th United Nations General Assembly in September 2021. I would like to request United Nations SCAF to be with us in this moment of success and extend their regional advisory services for expediting our development endeavor. My dear friends, Bangladesh appreciates the idea of establishing a thematic advisors group and wishes to nominate national experts from Bangladesh as well, if it is needed. We further hope that this advisors group will be able to give country-specific macroeconomic policy. Such macroeconomic policy advice, which will be helpful to the members to the member countries to design their own appropriate macroeconomic policies. Distinguished delegates, as you are aware, the economic emancipation of human race has been has often been hindered by not only act of God, like climate disasters, pandemics, but also man-made disasters. For example, we still remember the impact of two world wars and the Spanish flu of 1918, black deaths, smallpox, cholera, typhoid, and other epidemics. In our recorded history, first economic crisis the world experienced, it was in the 1930s, which is, which is known as Great Depression, which impaired our global economy extensively 
1996, the East Asian financial crisis, and in 2008, the Great Recession, had put major impediments towards global economy. And now, since December 2019, we are going through a pandemic which had already claimed the lives of about 5 million people and wiped out around 3% of our global economy. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear colleagues, as you are aware, the path of human civilization has not been always smooth, but has a history of survival and advancement hand in hand, facing calamities, epidemics, pandemics, and so on. Now, it is the time to tackle the existing threats of economic crisis, pandemics, and climate issues, which are risking well-being of our lives as well as our future generations. Ladies and gentlemen, and my colleagues, let us demonstrate our ability to work and act together by revamping our partnerships for the endurance of humankind and human civilization. Thank you. Thank you all, my dear friends. Now it is my pleasure to invite Mr. Elliot Harris, UN Assistant Secretary General for Economic Development and Chief Economist, United Nations Department, for, uh, Department of Economic and Social Affairs, to deliver his keynote statement. We are immensely grateful to Mr. Elliot Harris to joining us from New York live at this late hours. Mr. Harris, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Madam Executive Secretary, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, dear colleagues. After nearly two years, we still have not yet fully emerged from the COVID-19 crisis. Even as growth rates start to pick up globally, the recovery remains highly uneven, as many developing countries have lacked both the access to vaccines and the capacity to implement strong economic measures in support of a robust recovery. Moreover, recovering the, the output losses from the pandemic will be very difficult. To revert to the 2016-2019 output trend by 2030, the world economy would have to achieve an annual average growth rate of 3.5%, significantly above the pre-crisis trend of 2.9%. Moreover, we are unfortunately already facing increasing headwinds to economic recovery. More contagious variants of the virus and disruptions to production and exports from supply chain bottlenecks are hampering economic activities. Fuel and food costs are soaring, and financial conditions may start to tighten as central banks withdraw some of the extraordinary monetary policy support that they've granted over the last year and a half. We all remember how the Asia-Pacific region pulled the world economy out of the global financial crisis in 2008. Even now, several major Asian economies have been among the first to resume economic activities because they contained the virus relatively well last year, and entered the crisis with strong economic fundamentals. For the Asia-Pacific region as a whole, the pandemic will remain, however, the greatest risk in the foreseeable future, as uneven progress on vaccine rollout and many social restrictions persist. The spike in energy prices and power shortages will further disrupt the already strained supply chains. The region, as the Executive Secretary pointed out, has already lost the equivalent of 140 million full-time jobs in 2020, pushing a further 89 million people back into extreme poverty. The longer this pandemic persists, the larger these difficulties will become. Fiscal space has already shrunk due to the pandemic-induced fiscal responses, the economic slowdown, and reduced government revenues with a widespread increase in public debt levels. This limits the ability of countries to continue with essential fiscal spending and sustainable investments. Your Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, Ladies and gentlemen, none of this is a surprise. The region, in fact the whole world, was already off track in SDG implementation before the pandemic broke out. COVID-19 has just exacerbated some already existing weaknesses and vulnerabilities. This committee will deliberate on how to bring the region back on track towards the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and to mobilize financial resources in the current uncertain economic context. The resource question is key, and answering it 
requires transformative policy thinking and bold policy actions. But the thrust of that policy must not be directed only towards attracting new resources into sustainable investments, but also towards shifting the existing flow of resources away from unsustainable activities. There are many areas of the necessary infrastructure for sustainable development where private capital can take the lead. As an example, the digital infrastructure, renewable and clean energy, sustainable transportation, water and sanitation, sustainable buildings. All of these areas of private activity could free public resources to provide the goods and services that are less suited to provision by the private sector. In attracting new resources, attention must be focused on creating the appropriate conditions for that investment, a pipeline of investable projects at scale and reducing the perceived risk. That pipeline may require imaginative and innovative consolidation of projects to reach a critical mass that can attract capital at scale. The latter, reducing the perceived risks, requires efforts to de-risk private engagement economy-wise and not just project by project. But we should prioritize shifting the existing flow of resources away from unsustainable activities with equal, if not greater, vigor. It is inconsistent to push for investments in renewable energy while allowing or even encouraging continued investments in fossil fuels. That's a tremendous waste of scarce resources and an obstacle to achieving the SDGs. Because, ladies and gentlemen, as long as it is without consequence and profitable to do unsustainable things, some people will continue to do them. And this brings me to the thrust of my argument today. We were off track on SDG implementation even before the pandemic because our policies were not consistent with them. We must ensure that government policies and regulations and above all government budgets are consistent and aligned with the SDGs. When this happens, the stage will be set for shifting the flow of resources towards the sustainable investments that are needed. Governments can concentrate on providing the appropriate framing for those activities, leading by example through sustainable public procurement, for, in for instance, incentivizing sustainable alternatives and discouraging or prohibiting unsustainable ones, and ensuring that the difficult transitions are made as just as possible. Of course, this sort of shift cannot happen overnight. Transitions take time and they are often very painful, but they do not happen if they are delayed. Where immediate policy change is not possible, a credible commitment to that policy can often serve as an effective signpost to private investors. Policy predictability greatly reduces uncertainty and hence the perception of risk. Credible policy commitment also helps to build up public support for the direction of change and to mobilize the engagement of stakeholders to achieve it. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no trade-off between economic recovery and sustainable development goals, either in the short or the long term. The resource constraints that all governments face do not condemn them to total inaction. The recovery from COVID-19 can be put in place, can be an opportunity to put in place the types of policies that we need to encourage and support the just transition to sustainability by all actors. It is an opportunity to surmount the debilitating policy hesitancy that has crippled our efforts thus far. Asia Pacific, having been the driver of global economic growth for so many years, now can and should play a more prominent role as a leader for sustainable development and recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Harris, for your very insightful remarks. Now it is my pleasure to invite Mr. Bam Bang Susantono, Vice President for Knowledge Management and Sustainable Development, Asian Development Bank, to deliver his keynote statement. Mr. Susantono, the floor is yours. Thank you. Executive Secretary Iwar Midali Savannah, Excellencies, Distinguished Speakers, Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, a very good day to all of you. On behalf of the Asian Development Bank, I'm honored to share my views on the type of economic policies and financing strategies that will help our region, Asia Pacific, recover from the pandemic and get us back toward achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. May I have my slides? Okay, good. 
let me begin by briefly sharing our view on developing Asia short-term economic prospects. Asia and the Pacific is recovering strongly from the last year GDP contractions. We anticipate growth will bounce back to a robust 7.1% this year before moderating to 5.4% in 2022. However, growth has varied widely due to the uneven progress in vaccinations. In our latest forecast, we raised the figure for East Asia, which avoided large COVID-19 outbreaks and made better progress on vaccinations. We did the same for Central Asia, although this was due to higher commodity prices. Forecasts, however, were downgraded for Southeast Asia, South Asia, and the Pacific, as major economies in those subregions continue to struggle with COVID-19 outbreaks and slower vaccination rollout. The main risk to the recovery remains pandemic-related, including the emergence of new variants, less vaccine efficacy, and slow progress on getting people inoculated. Next slide, please. So even before the pandemic, the Asia-Pacific region was widely known to be off track to achieving the SDGs, especially those related to climate action goals. Progress slowed further as the pandemic disproportionately affected the poor and vulnerable. That is why Asia must build resilience to be prepared for high impact risk. The biggest is climate change. We cannot go back to the way things were before COVID-19. We must make the recovery green, resilient, inclusive, and sustainable. To do this, of course, we need financial resources that also has been touched by the previous speaker, well above what the public sector can provide. According to the 2019 UNS Cap report, the Asia-Pacific region needs to invest 1.5 trillion annually, or about 4% of regional GDP, to achieve the SDGs by 2030. As the pandemic both reduced government revenues and increased expenditures for health and stimulus, we must build our sustainable finance structure to mobilize more private capital. Next slide, please. The good news is that sustainable finance work. Our Asian Development Outlook 2021 shows that it has positive environmental and social impacts. Innovative instruments like thematic bonds and impact bonds are part of the solution and they have produced results efficiently. The left-hand chart in this slide, as you can see, shows that Asian firms issuing green bonds improved their average environmental performance score by 17% one year after issuance and 30% two years afterwards. The right-hand diagram explains how a typical social impact bond works. It helps investors share social investment risk with the public sector or donors and service providers. One good example of a social impact bond has been the Educate Girls Development Impact Bond in India, showing impressive gains in both school enrollment and learning outcomes. Next slide, please. Sustainable finance continues to expand rapidly across the world. Asia is now the second largest regional sustainable bond market after Europe, accounting for around 20% of the global sustainable bond market. The strong momentum in sustainable finance increasingly makes financial sense. Global and Asian institutional investors want to hedge and mitigate sustainability risk. They also want greater resilience during systemic or one-off shocks. Stakeholder preferences are also changing. According to the Bloomberg, approximately one-third of all assets under management, somewhere between 30 and $40 trillion, are now subject to some form of sustainability or ESG framework around the world. Many leading institutional investors are now incorporating ESG factors into their investment decisions. However, sustainable finance remains institutionally underdeveloped. It lacks even basic elements such as common taxonomies and standards. Information asymmetry and weak governance requires greater transparency, better reporting, and information disclosure. Next slide, please. This is on the multilateral. Multilateral institutions like ADB can attract more private capital for sustainable finance. We participate in markets through direct financing, growing in new finance, and providing innovative financing solutions. We can also help develop sustainable finance markets and support local authorities build market infrastructure and ecosystems. Together with partners like ESCAP, we can also help countries strengthen policy, knowledge, and capacity. 
ADB has issued approximately, approximately $6.2 billion equivalent team bonds since 2010 to catalyze capital to support key initiatives such as water programs, gender, health, and education projects through its AAA quality notes. Our green bond program has raised about $10 billion since 2015 for green projects. It has also helped our developing members issue green bonds. In February 2021, ADB issued its first education bonds of about 57 million US dollar to finance a pool of education related projects. And in September, ADB issued its first blue bonds, raising $301 million to finance ocean related projects in Asia and the Pacific. As of 7 October 2021, the amount of outstanding theme green and blue bonds is approximately $13 billion equivalent. Another example of ADB's program to leverage more finance is the Asian Catalytic Green Finance Facility. It reduces risk on green projects and leverage private capital. And we also invest in green projects across the region. Example include the Cambodia Solar Park projects, SDG Indonesia One Green Finance Facility, Greater Mali Waste to Energy Project in the Maldives, and the Shandong Green Development Fund in the People's Republic of China. Next slide, please. ADB also provides knowledge support under the Asia Bond Market Initiative. ADB maintains the regional bond market data portal and information platform, the Asian Bond Online, which is the reference for many of the uh, players in the bond market. We also regularly publish knowledge products such as the Asia Bond Monitor and ASEAN Plus 3 Sustainable Bond Highlights. Next slides on policies. So naturally, government policy plays a vital role in attracting both private and public capital into sustainable finance. Laws and regulation can help guide private capital toward the SDGs. Policies help by enforcing common international standards for disclosing information and monitoring impact. Policymakers can safeguard overall financial stability by incorporating sustainability risks into their micro and macro credential framework. They can further strengthen market infrastructure and ecosystems for sustainable finance, and they can work to mobilize more public financial resources to support public spending on SDGs. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, during this recovery phase, let us all work closely together to achieve a green, resilient, inclusive, and sustainable trajectory for Asia and the Pacific. We need to uphold the commitments made under the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and create innovative financing solutions to promote investment that are better aligned with the SDGs. I myself truly believe our region can get back on track to meet SDG targets by 2030. And as the premier development partner in Asia and the Pacific, ADB remains firmly committed to working with our development partners and all stakeholders in helping our developing members achieve this goal. Thank you very much, and back to you. Thank you, Mr. Susantono, for a very insightful presentation. This concludes Agenda 1A. The keynote addresses by the distinguished speakers have indeed provided us with lots of insights that I'm sure will guide the discussions of the committee. Excellences, distinguished delegates, I would like to move to agenda item 1B, the election of officers of the Bureau for the third session of the Committee on Macroeconomic Policy, Poverty Reduction, and Financing for Development. The Bureau will comprise a chair and three vice chairs. May I open the floor for any nominations? I recognize the distinguished delegate from Philippines. To nominate the Bureau of the third session of the Committee on Macroeconomic Policy, Poverty Reduction and Financing for Development as follows. Chair, his Excellency, Mr. Rahmat Budiman, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary and Permanent Representative to ESCAP, Embassy of the Republic of Indonesia, Vice Chairs, 
Her Excellency Ms. Raushan Yes Bulatova, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary and Permanent Representative to ASCAP, Embassy of the Republic of Kazakhstan, His Excellency Mr. Ganesh Prasad Dakal, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary and Permanent Representative to ASCAP, um, Embassy of Nepal. His Excellency Mr. Viera Kim, Deputy Secretary General, National Committee for ESCAP, Royal Government of, in, of Cambodia. Thank you, Distinguished Delegate of Philippines. Do any other delegates wish to suggest alternative nominations or second these nominations? I recognize the Distinguished Delegate from Pakistan. Mr. Secretary, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Pakistan uh, seconds the no uh, nominations just made. Thank you very much. Thank you, Distinguished Delegate from Pakistan. I also recognize the Distinguished Delegate from China. Mr. Secretary, uh, distinguished delegates, uh, the delegation of China would like the second nomination of the bureau proposed by uh, His Excellency, Mr. of Philippines. Thank you. Thank you, distinguished delegates of China. Are there any other nominations for the various positions of the bureau? I hear none. I thus have the pleasure to formally announce that the Bureau of the Third Session of the Committee on Macroeconomic Policy, Poverty Reduction and Financing for Development is composed of the following. Chair, His Excellency, Mr. Rahmat Budiman, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary and Permanent Representative to ASCAP, Embassy of the Republic of Indonesia. Vice Chairs, her Excellency, Ms. Roshan Yesbulatova, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary and Permanent Representative to ASCAP, Embassy of the Republic of Kazakhstan. His Excellency, Mr. Ganesh Prasad Dhakal, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary and Permanent Representative to ASCAP, Embassy of Nepal. His Excellency, Mr. Viera Kim, Deputy Secretary General, National Committee for ASCAP, Royal Government of Cambodia. Please join me in congratulating the Bureau for their election. I'm now pleased to invite the Chair of the meeting to take his seat at the rostrum. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, it is now my honor to invite His Excellency Mr. Rahmat Budiman from Indonesia, the chair of the third session of the Committee on Macroeconomic Policy, Poverty Reduction and Financing for Development to conduct the meeting from this point onwards. Thank you, Mr. Malik. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, it is indeed an honor and privilege for me to assume the chair of this important meeting. On behalf of other members of the Bureau, I wish to express our appreciation to distinguished representative for the confidence you have placed in us. As the chair of the third session of the Committee on Macroeconomic Policy, Poverty Reduction and Financing for Development, I shall do my best to ensure that this meeting achieves its objectives 
and produces fruitful outcomes for our future work together. In these connections, I would like to rely on the spirit of cooperation and involvement of all the students, delegates, and the able support of the members of the Bureau. Please allow me to also express my appreciation to the Secretariat of ESCAF for the arrangement of this meeting. And furthermore, I also would like to express my appreciation to distinguished speakers for the delivery of thoughtful messages during the opening session. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, let us take up the agenda item C, the adoption of the agenda. The provisional agenda is contained in document SCAP slash CMPF slash 2021 slash L1. In addition to document indicated in the provisional annotated agenda, the Secretariat has prepared two additional information documents for the session. This first document, SCAP slash CMPF slash INF slash 1, contains initial idea for the terms of the reference of the suggested consultative group on financing strategies for the Sustainable Development Goals. As discussed in the document, SCAP slash CMPF slash 2021 slash 3. The Secretariat has prepared these initial ideas for the considerations of member states based on the request of some delegations for more details about the proposed consultative group. The second document, SCAP slash CMPF slash INF slash 2, provides an update on recent SCAP events related to innovative finance and digital finance that Secretariat has recently organized. Are there any comments on the Agenda 1? If there are no comments, the Agenda in Document SCAP slash CNPF slash 2021 slash 1 is adopted. Thank you. Before we proceed with the agenda item two, I would like to invite Secretariat to provide some housekeeping announcement. The Secretariat, you have the floor. Um, may, may I provide some quick reminders for the delegates, participants joining us via a conferencing platform, KUDO. To select the preferred UN language, the language selector with drop-down menu is available on the lower left of your screen. When you want to make intervention, kindly click Request to Speak button. When the chair calls upon you to take the floor, the microphone and camera icons will turn into red. Please click and mute the microphone and turn on the video and deliver your intervention. Do not click done speaking until you have completed your intervention as this will cancel your request. Once you have completed your intervention, kindly click done speaking. For technical issues related to KUDO, Kindly click Technical Support tab under the messaging icon and type your message there. Our technician will assist you shortly. The Secretariat will be monitoring the messaging in KUDO. However, the Secretariat kindly request that all substantive questions or intervention to be raised through your delegation by using the request to speak button only. And finally, to prevent echoes and interference, please stay on the original language when you speak and ensure all other devices connected to KUDO in the same room are turned off. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Secretariat. We shall now take up agenda item two toward an inclusive, resilient, 
and sustainable economic recovery from the coronavirus disease pandemic. The committee document SCAP slash CNPF slash 2021 slash 1 has been shared in advance to inform the deliberations of the committee on this topic. The deliberation will be divided into three segments, a concise introduction by the agenda, uh, on the, of the agenda item by the Secretariat, followed by an informative panel discussion, and third segment dedicated to formal statement by delegations and statements from other registered participants at this meeting. May I now invite the Secretariat to introduce the agenda item. It is my pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Malik Hamjah Ali Malik, Director, Macroeconomic Policy and Financing for Development Division to introduce agenda item two. Mr. Malik, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Chair, Vice Chairs, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates. Highlighting the devastating effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on the socioeconomic well-being of people in Asia and the Pacific, the document SCAP slash CMPF slash 2021 slash 1 discusses risks of a K-shaped economic recovery, which is essentially characterized by widened inequality, both within and across countries. The pandemic has also revealed the region's lack of resilience and vulnerability to effectively cope with such non-economic shocks that have large economic effects. It is a stark reminder that long-term and systematic development risks, when they materialize, can cause years of socioeconomic progress to evaporate. No doubt, most countries have responded aggressively and quickly to deal with the crisis induced by the pandemic by introducing several large-scale fiscal, monetary, and financial measures. Yet, such responses in several developing countries of our region have been inadequate owing to fiscal and financial constraints. The increasing debt distress in some countries also threatens the continuity of essential fiscal spending and investments in future sustainable development. Lack of fiscal space and rising debt vulnerabilities has left little space for investments in the transformation required to attain inclusive, resilient, and sustainable economies. This document provides a rich menu of policy options that countries can consider to ensure an inclusive recovery, build economic resilience to future shocks, and support the transition towards a green economy. To build forward better on these lines, the document also briefly discusses an illustrative policy package aimed at ensuring access to social services, closing the digital divide, and strengthening climate and clean energy actions. The details of such a policy package and the underlying macroeconometric model, along with the wide-ranging beneficial impacts, are discussed in our flagship publication the Economic and Social Survey of Asia and the Pacific 2021, published in last April. Understanding the importance of fiscal means to implement such policies, the document also discusses policy options that can secure the needed fiscal resources. Therefore, I invite the committee members to discuss policies that have been implemented by them in their respective countries to support an inclusive resilient and sustainable recovery. It will also be very enlightening to learn how policymakers in your country are addressing the fiscal constraints while pursuing inclusive, resilient, and sustainable development pathways. I look forward to an engaging discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Malik. I would now like to give the floor to Mrs. Sweta Saxena, Chief of the Macroeconomic Policy and Analysis Section, to moderate the panel discussion. Mrs. Saxena, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Today we are extremely delighted to have four very knowledgeable and distinguished panelists with us who will share their perspective on the region's transformation towards more inclusive, resilient, and environmentally sustainable economies. 
Um, so let me introduce all four speakers right now. Can we get them on the screen? Okay, so can we get Yes. Wonderful. So we have four wonderful speakers here. Let me just give you a quick uh, rundown on our speakers. Uh, our very first speaker is Mr. Uh, His Excellency Mr. Pan Sobanit. He's the Under Secretary of State of, of the Ministry of Planning of Cambodia. And we have Ms. Poonam Gupta, who is the Director General of National Council for, Economic, uh, of a, for Applied Economic Research in New Delhi, India. And we have Mr. Dong Yung Park, who's a principal economist at Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department of the Asian Development Bank. And last but not the least, we have Mr. Antonio Fatas, who's the Portuguese Council Chaired Professor of European Studies and Professor of Economics at INSEED in Singapore. So let's start the discussion well, uh, with Mr. Um, Mr. Pan. Asia-Pacific least developed countries, including Cambodia, were hard hit by COVID-19 due to the inherent economic vulnerabilities and lack of resources and means to respond to the shocks forcibly. ESCAP warned about the risk of a K-shaped recovery in its 2021 Economic and Social Survey of Asia and the Pacific, which is characterized by widening development gaps both across and within countries in the aftermath of the pandemic. Now into the third quarter of this year, this risk appears to be materializing. From Cambodia's perspective, what policy measures can be taken domestically to promote a more inclusive and resilient recovery? And equally importantly, what can regional and international community do to better support the least developed countries in the post-pandemic recovery effort so that no country and no, uh, nobody is left behind? Uh, the floor is yours, Mr. Pan. Mr. Pan, could you request to speak? Yes. The floor is yours. Mr. Pan, would you please turn on your mic and uh, video? Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. For over the past 15 years or so, Cambodia had enjoyed about 7% of GDP growth per annum, and the COVID-19 had changed that, had changed that. And, but it also presented us a new opportunity to build forward better to towards a more inclusive, more sustainable, more resilient economic models. And for that, Cambodia undertaken uh, policy policy measures on three areas, which is to ensure uh, economic equality, to ensure vaccine equality and educational equality. And at, and it did, at the the individual level, we focus on scaling up our cash transfer program to those in need, to poor and vulnerable households. And at 5% of GDP, it is one of the largest in the region. It is swiftly, it is unprecedented, but it also drain our budget and increase our debt to GDP ratio. And for business size, we focus on ensuring their recovery, their survival during the pandemic and after the pandemic through tax relief for businesses in tourism industry, in manufacturing industry, particularly in garment sector. We also ensure and facilitate uh, access to finance for small businesses and we inject cash, inject capital into rural development to assess to assist agro up processing firms in that sector. We also work with private financial sector to ensure that 
loans are available to businesses by lowering their credit requirements. And we also work with the private sector and to reduce red tapes for businesses and to facilitate trade between it for companies in the country and also for investment from abroad FDI. And none of that is possible without vaccine. And with that, we work with international community to ensure that there is vaccine available to people. We reduce vaccine inequality in the country. We actually uh, eliminate it like about 25 million doses have been administered. Over 80% of population from age six has been fully vaccinated and many have already received third doses. And with that, we reduce uh, vaccine inequality and let us to, we are more ready now to resume our activities in, in a normal way prior to the COVID. And we also make sure that no child left behind by ensuring that when during the closure period of schools, public and private, students in rural area and private, in rural and urban areas receive education through broadcasting, through TV channels, teaching programs, and radio station. And for the res uh, resilient economic recovery, we work through our national policy rectangular strategy to ensure that our economic model become more diverse by promoting our agricultural agriculture industry. And thanks to Cambodia and China trade agreement, uh, our agriculture industry has become more diversified and more flow of investment has been towards uh, this industry. And for green economy uh, to be more resilient, economic recovery need to be sustainable. And we commit, we would like to reiterate, reiterate our commitment towards uh, achieving the, to reducing carbon emissions to ensure, uh, to fight against climate change. And over the past thing, I think since 2016, we have accumulated and we have sold over 11 million of carbon credits and that fund can be used to for new conservative program and community development and our green economic department of ministry of planning in particular have uh, is mandated to to ensure public green procurement and to ensure to promote more green investment into uh, to ensure that the recovery is greener and more sustainable. And for the second part of your questions, how how can international community do to support uh, uh, least developed countries like Cambodia? which is just passed for the first time, passed the meet the requirement to graduate from the status, the LDC status. And with that, I think, uh, to, to, I think what is important to us now is the support for capacity building, for capa capability building, for technology transfer, because in this, this, in this difficult time, there are uh, sectors, there are jobs, there are laws, and there are new jobs, there are created. And those jobs are te probably tend to be more technology intensive. They need more skills. So this kind of uh, training, building, capacity building, we have people in Cambodia transit to those jobs easily. And since we, Fast for, fast for the first time the, to graduate from the LDC status. I think more, now trade is very important to us, especially in this, this difficult time. And with that, I think uh, 
developed country can help encourage and facilitate trade flow into Cambodia, that will be very helpful. And also, the loans for this time is important because, as I said earlier, we respond forcefully and unprecedentedly towards achieving, towards helping poor households and drain our fiscal space, our budget. And with that, concessional loan will be helpful for poor countries like Cambodia toward recovering from this pandemic. And for direct investment, FDI, inward direct investment, I think those investments need to be more green so that we can have sustain our economy better, especially during this time. For example, last year, Cambodia experienced flooding and that caused a lot of loss to lives, health, livestock, crops, buildings, houses, infrastructures, and green investment is very helpful for us. And last but not least, just like common cold or flu, it seems that for now we are unable to eradicate this COVID-19. So we need to learn to adapt, to live with it safely. So vaccine cooperation with international community is key here to ensure that we can resume our normal economic activities. Thank, thank you for letting me have a floor and I would like to conclude my remarks for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pan. Moving on to our next speaker, Ms. Gupta. Sustained and resilient economic growth is always a central objective of macroeconomic policies. Although Asia-Pacific developing countries performed relatively well during the 2007-8 global financial crisis, they proved less economically resilient when confronted with COVID-19 pandemic. What is the key role for macroeconomic resilience traditionally? What new macroeconomic vulnerabilities were exposed by COVID-19? What economic preparedness do you think would be needed for Asia-Pacific developing countries to better brace their economic uh, economies against future shocks? The floor is yours, Ms. Gupta. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for this opportunity to be present in this panel with all the other esteemed guests. Let me first answer your question on the macroeconomic resilience of emerging markets and developing countries, and specifically countries in the Asia and Pacific region. As you mentioned, uh, emerging and developing countries are now much better prepared to withstand the traditional macroeconomic shocks than they were in the 1990s or earlier. Typically, the shocks that economies can encounter include domestic demand or supply shocks, commodity price shocks, or global demand or liquidity shocks. During the 1990s or prior to that, countries were periodically impacted by a balance of payment crisis, a capital account crisis, or a growth crisis. But the countries are now better um, adept at assessing those shocks and to withstand the impacts. And it is because they have built policy buffers, they know their potential policy toolkits, and they use them in a timely fashion. Their macroeconomic frameworks are more resilient too. And what do I mean by that? Countries increasingly have more flexible exchange rates, stronger financial sectors, and more independent central banks. Besides their central banks they, uh, being independent, they also have more transparent and stronger monetary policy frameworks, and some of them operate under the inflation targeting framework. Their fiscal institutions are somewhat stronger too. Increasingly, countries are also being integrated in the international financial markets. They have better availability of data and there's more intense scrutiny and monitoring of the economic health on an ongoing basis. All of this is resulting in more resilience and this uh, greater resilience can be seen in the fact that there are fewer balance of payment crises that occur within these countries and very few countries now rely on emergency support from the IMF to weather a crisis. When it comes to COVID, COVID was not a typical macroeconomic shock. Therefore, it's hard to compare it with anything else that we have seen before. COVID has been 
and it is still an ongoing crisis, it has been a health shock of unprecedented magnitude and uncertainty. The uncertainty has pertained to its intensity, duration, and an ever-evolving nature. It has, in fact, been a combination of shocks. Domestic and external all rolled into one. In my view, given the scale and complexity of the shock, countries have, in fact, proven to be rather resilient and mature. Again, the central banks have had the technical capabilities and the policy room to respond. The banking sectors thus far have turned out to be rather well prepared as well. Policymakers had the clarity of vision regarding the use of fiscal policy in responding to the crisis. So in some ways, therefore, the countries have exhibited both the policy room as well as the maturity to respond to the crisis. So what is the key for macroeconomic resilience? I'll sum it up as the key to macroeconomic resilience is the ability to assess the risks and potentially also to anticipate them to be able to prepare a response strategy and importantly to have the policy room to be able to respond to them and it is an outcome of a fine balance in the fiscal policy in monetary policy a robust financial sector strong household and corporate balance sheets and the capacity to indulge in regulatory forbearance as appropriate you also asked what are the new macroeconomic vulnerabilities that were exposed by COVID-19. In my view, two new vulnerabilities have been exposed by the crisis. While these may not necessarily seem macroeconomic at first blush, they can have macroeconomic significance in the long run. The first one is about the social safety nets. The COVID shock has proven beyond doubt that it is imperative to build nimble and extensive social safety nets. The second vulnerability is about the status of education and health in a country, and consequently, the temporary or permanent blow that COVID-19 has dealt to countries in the region. It is therefore important to take stock of the medium-term damage caused by COVID-19, especially the learning, health, and gender gaps that have emerged and to make plans to bridge these gaps. Finally, what economic preparedness would be needed for the region to better brace the economies against future shocks? So as I mentioned, the preparedness for a traditional macroeconomic shock is rather well known. Therefore, it will be important to ensure that the financial sector remains stable and resilient. There is room in the fiscal and monetary policy frameworks to combat any shock and Modern social safety nets are developed that can be invoked efficiently and quickly when needed. Finally, strengthening of the IT and digital infrastructure, enhanced IT integration, greater financial inclusion, and better preparedness to implement digital platforms would be very useful too. I thank again for the opportunity to be invited here, and I conclude my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gupta. Uh, let's move on to our third speaker, Mr. Dong Yung Park. Mr. Park, the 2021 Asian Development Outlook focused on financing for a green and inclusive recovery from the pandemic. However, as SCAP's 2021 Economic and Social Survey highlighted, the direct spending on environmental and social well-being remained highly limited in the first batch of stimulus packages in the region. What do you think are the greatest bottlenecks for a green and inclusive recovery to materialize? And meanwhile, where are the greatest opportunities? The floor is yours, Mr. Park. Good morning, everyone. I am Dongyan Park of the Asian Development Bank. And it is a great honor for me to speak on the important topic of financing a green and inclusive recovery at the Committee on Macroeconomic Policy, Poverty Reduction and Financing for Development of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. My presentation today will be based largely 
on the special theme chapter of this year's Asian Development Outlook, which was launched in April. COVID-19 highlights the need for developing Asia to achieve a green and inclusive recovery. Such a recovery addresses not only urgent pandemic related needs, such as public health and job creation, but also the importance of building resilience against future shocks, especially shocks related to climate change. Resuming the journey towards sustainable development goals requires mobilizing vast amounts of capital from both the public and private sectors. The chart shows that increased fiscal expenditures and declining tax revenues contributed to greater fiscal deficits across the region during COVID-19. This reduction in fiscal space underlines the fact that private capital has to play a greater role. New policy instruments and innovative financing strategies are needed to foster the market for sustainable finance. The good news is that sustainable finance is gaining momentum in Asia. Green and social financial markets in the region grew rapidly during the COVID-19 pandemic. In particular, social finance expanded rapidly in the region in line with increased awareness of social risks and the need for inclusiveness. The left-hand chart shows that the ASEAN plus three sustainable bond market expanded to 345.2 billion US dollars at the end of June 2021, which represents year on year growth of almost 54%. The right hand chart shows that Asia now accounts for nearly 20% of the global sustainable bond market, making it the second largest regional sustainable bond market after Europe. The expansion of green and social finance can be sustained because it is increasingly driven by financial motives. In particular, there is a demand to hedge and mitigate sustainable risks. The preferences of investors and stakeholders are changing toward SDG aligned investments. And finally, there is a demand to seek greater resilience against systematic and idiosyncratic shocks. Both global and Asian investors are incorporating social and environmental factors into their investment portfolio decision making. For example, according to a B Finance survey, seven out of 10 Asian institutional investors had ESG investment policies. Carbon pricing helps to close the funding gap during the low carbon transition. It internalizes the external costs of carbon emissions by increasing the cost of carbon emissions. The two main types of carbon pricing instruments are emissions trading schemes and carbon taxes. There is growing momentum in the usage of carbon pricing instruments in Asia. The region's economies can leverage its experience to develop carbon pricing schemes that help close the funding gap during the low carbon transition. Innovative policies and financing strategies are vital for mobilizing more private and public capital for sustainable investments. It is important for governments to strengthen tax revenues to support SDG-oriented 
public investments. At the same time, governments must utilize regulation and policies to guide private capital toward sustainable investments. For example, policies can align finance with SDGs to incorporate sustainable risks into micro and macro prudential frameworks. Let me conclude with what I think are the three key messages for financing a green and inclusive recovery. First, a green and inclusive post-pandemic recovery requires mobilizing public and private capital. Second, the rapid growth of private green and social finance is sustainable because it is increasingly driven by financial self-interest. Third, public policy is vital for fostering sustainable finance. In particular, policy to enforce common standards of information disclosure and impact measurement will significantly benefit the market. Thank you, Mr. Park. Coming to our last speaker, uh, Mr. Fatas. Even before the pandemic, countries around the world had been on a path of accumulating more public debt. Asia and the Pacific is no exception. However, while developed countries were able to, be, to use unorthodox means to finance huge amounts of additional debt, most developing countries have found the lack of fiscal space the greatest handicap in their response to COVID-19. What is your perspective on the outlook of the public debt challenge today? especially considering scarring effects of the pandemic, which reduces future growth potentials. And are there any policy options that developing countries could explore to free up some fiscal space while still maintaining fiscal and macroeconomic stability uh, and sustainability? The floor is yours, Mr. Fathers. I think Mr. Fatas, could you, yeah, done. Um. Okay, so um, apologies, actually, we couldn't get the last speaker to speak. But that sums up for this very informative panel, Mr. Pan, Mr. Gu Ms. Gupta, and Mr. Park. Thank you so much for, um, for, for all your interventions and valuable insights, which will surely benefit the subsequent deliberation of our committee. Now let me give the floor back to our chair for further actions. The floor is yours, Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Saxena, for moderating the panel. And thank you for distinguished panelists for your valuable contribution to our deliberation on this agenda item uh, two. And now it's already 12.03. It means that uh, we are beyond our allocated time for this morning session. So, and I recognize uh, there's a delegate wish to take the floor. And for this matter, we will continue our deliberation on agenda item two at the uh, afternoon sessions, which we resume at two o'clock. So the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>